and welcome to everybody on YouTube that's joined me today. Welcome to the Friday webinar. It's going to take a second here to do a couple of other things. I'll share my screen and we'll talk today about digital badges. Okay, thanks to everyone for coming. Welcome to the Friday webinar. It's 12 noon Eastern time. We try to do this almost every Friday or at least three out of every four lately, it seems. I'll be away next week adjudicating at a music festival, so we won't have a webinar next Friday. But beyond that, I'll just bring you up to speed on what I have planned into the month of May. Or actually, sorry, no, next week we are here. We are here. It's April 26, two weeks from now that we'll be without a webinar. Next week on April 19th, Christopher Norton's going to join us for part two of his micro lessons that he started back at the beginning of March. I believe the date on that is March 1st. He was to present part two on March 8th, but he was unable. And so we've rescheduled that for next Friday. Those of you that were planning to take that and you're still going to have to register for that again at the new April 19th date next Friday. April 26th, we're taking off. And then May 3rd, Friday, May 3rd, we're going to have a really interesting presentation by Silent Film Celebration. I don't know if any of you have seen this. Um, I haven't seen it in action myself, but I've read a lot about it. And we're going to have a representative come in and talk to us about how that all works. And it's basically where you can set up your studio recital in the form of a silent film being broadcast on a screen at the front of the audience. And the students take turns playing the incidental music to accompany the film. Uh, they've got many films available now that they can do that with, and it matches all different levels. And so if you're all at all curious about shaking things up in your studio recitals or trying a really interesting event such as that, join me on Friday, May 3rd, where we'll talk with uh, someone from the silent film celebration. And then on Friday, May 10th, we're going to have Dr. Evgeny Chuganov. He's a professor of music at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, here where I live. And he's going to share with us some research that he's done into very specific schools of technique. And I'll be able to give you more information about that in a couple of weeks' time as well. Today, we're going to talk about digital badges. If anyone that's here with me live has any questions, feel free to throw those in the chat box as we go along. It's probably better than the Q&A today uh, because I'm here by myself today and I'm having the slideshow going. And so where I'd like to start here is to create a really good digital badge webinar. We've done a couple of these in the past, but I haven't shown a comprehensive slideshow for this yet. And so if you have anyone that you want to share this presentation with, any other teachers, any parents or students that might be interested, feel free to share this. This will be our first really comprehensive look at digital badges now that we're also launching digital badges for voice and guitar. Most of you know that we've already launched this for piano a couple of years ago. Uh, some of you on the call here today, I say, have used the digital badges already and, and seem to be liking it. We're getting a lot of really great feedback on it. And so that's why we decided to roll it out. And it's now, as of yesterday, available for voice and guitar as well. So we hope to spread the word to all the voice students and teachers and guitar students and teachers because we think it's a really fabulous option. I'd like to start first by just talking about the exam and how do we view an exam um, you know, it's a unique moment in a music student's life. It can be a milestone on a path to achievement, uh, a goal to be reached, a measure of progress, and simply using a snapshot in time. And it's that snapshot in time, I think, where a lot of people get tripped up these days because it's hard for young students, especially, and even some adult learners I've seen, where it's hard to envision how the exam is going to play out. And that it's hard to get their heads around, it seems, more and more all the time around focusing all of the energy to one moment in time where you have to execute a large number of things for an examiner. And it takes months and months of preparation to get it right, to be somewhat successful. And so that snapshot in time, I think, is what's starting to trip people up a little bit. And it's no secret that the number of people participating in exams is dropping. And I'll speak to that a little bit later. And so we can try to highlight the best fit line through the highs and lows of the student's effort to honor their work in an exam but what we're finding is it often doesn't turn out the way students want for various reasons. Uh, the new reality, it's actually not all that new, but only about 5% of students, according to our stats and, and surveys that we take, now take exams. That number's down a little, little bit all the time. It tends to drop about 5% a year. There are a number of you out there, teachers, that um, are still able to submit at least half of your studios for exams. That's, that's quite an exception, though. By and large, when we look across the country, and especially in larger centers, but also in some rural locations, there is so much competing for students' time and interest now that for them to commit to a full certificate exam in its traditional form has become quite prohibitive. So I've written some things here about you know, what's influencing this from our point of view, 
And we're going to issue a teacher survey very shortly here, early May, so that you can give us some feedback on what you're seeing in your studios. Now that we're coming to the end of another academic year, we feel it's a good time to reach out and talk about these kind of things and take stock of where, where we're at. Uh, students can be overscheduled and overwhelmed by other activities and schoolwork. That's been increasing for a long time. And that's something that doesn't seem to go away. And those students that we want or think have the commitment or the ability to do an exam are often competing with these other things that are going on. It all usually starts at school and their need to want to score 90s in their subjects. Students that maybe aren't as studious at school, those aren't the students we're usually seeing that would qualify for exams anyway. We'll talk later on about what we can do, and that's the digital badge. Students don't seem to prioritize music learning as highly as other activities. This is an interesting one. I, I recently talking with some university students as they come to the end of their year and talking about how they decided to go into music. And a couple of students identified this pressure at the end of grade 12 when talking with their friends, you know, what are you going to do next year? What are you going to do? What are you going to study at university? And, and, and getting peer pressure to not study music is a really interesting thing that I hadn't really heard of before. So in addition to the economic pressures, social pressures are also taking over and students are less likely, especially those that are really talented in music, to actually study music. And this probably starts earlier on in high school as well. They prioritize their schoolwork and other athletic endeavors ahead of the music learning that we're able to offer them. Music, I think, in our culture, by and large, is seen more as a recreational endeavor. And you certainly see that with a lot of your parents. And I'm sure some of you still have access to select markets where that's not the case. And so we still value that. We still see that in a lot of our exam results. But those, those people participating at that level um, are, are dropping. Social media and the smartphone have competed for students' attention, I'd say, since about 2008. That's when we started noticing a really big drop in exam numbers. Around 2008, it was fashionable for high school students to carry a smartphone around with them. And ever since that moment, even in my own studio, I noticed the amount of practicing that gets done by those older students has dropped off considerably. And it's almost as if, you know, instead of watching TV like my generation would have, they're now watching YouTube and really getting sucked into this communication where they can stay in touch with their friends all day long and all evening long. That competes for homework time. Homework time then gets squished into this really small thing between texts, and then there's really no time left for piano practice. I think just this perfect storm of things that seems to be leading to a lack of rigor in our students. Um, there's a lack of rigor in high school at times for certain things, and we certainly see it at the university level too. So exams have become difficult for students to commit to. Um, we have to have all this repertoire prepared all at once. There's performance anxiety increasing as rehearsal time decreases. We see a, uh, more students now, I'd say much more nervous in the exam room, even if it's online. Online is a really great feature and 70% of the students are choosing that option now because they like that convenience factor, but they also like the fact the examiner is not actually in the room with them. So they feel more at ease. Well, I'll tell you, if a student's not well prepared, they still aren't really at ease and we're not seeing marks increase as we might expect with the online exams. Skills are seen as mundane tasks that don't fit into a youth's worldview. This is an interesting one. We still need some time to think about this, but you know, by and large over the last decade, we've seen students just simply not practice their technique. The numbers on technique have dropped steadily over the last decade. Uh, there's virtually no time to get to ear training and sight reading to work on that anymore, but yet they're still part of the exam. And so that whole thing there where skills are seen as a mundane task. And when you have a smartphone in your hands that has, gives you access to most of the information in the world at your fingertips, you're less likely to believe in or think that these patterns are, are worth practicing or that these skills are worth developing necessarily. It's enough just to play repertoire. And that's the recreational, enjoyable part of the music. It doesn't always fit into the assessment for the exam anymore. There's a declining focus in our culture on assessment in general, and I think the pandemic effects sort of play into that where we saw many cases in high school, especially where exams were no longer required. Attendance at school in person was no longer required, and similar things happening at the university level. That's all filtering down to our exam system that we find where the expectation just simply isn't there. It's almost as if we've proven to people that you know, we don't really need exams to survive. There's still food on the table. There's still things to do. We can still live our lives without the rigor. And so all of that has led to this drop in exam numbers over time. We're definitely seeing it. And so in anticipation of the pandemic, although we couldn't forecast that pandemic was coming, we started to build this idea of digital badges where students could 
uh, or buy into a softer commitment in a way, in a way that allows them to have a little bit more control over their learning and find a way to reach the other 95% of students who aren't able to take our exams. I'll talk a little bit about the detail of the digital badges as we go, but first of all, the benefits that we see, it provides that performance goal that students are looking for, even though it's not a live performance in front of a live examiner or an in-person examiner. It eliminates the pressure of live performance somewhat, but through my experience with digital badges and other teachers have said it emulates it in a different kind of way because we have to video record these performances, which students expect to be really good. Students now have control over creating their ideal performances because everything is pre-recorded, and I'll talk to that in a little bit. Students can work at their own pace, and we can capture these short bursts of curiosity that they come up with where all of a sudden for a week they don't have extra assignments at school, um, or it's been raining out or snowing out more, or there's a snow day and a student sits down and practices for an hour or so. They can now come to a lesson and we see that they're interested. We can throw on the camera and record some of their efforts and try to get some momentum around the, the work that they were able to put into that for those students that can't you know, put in 40 weeks of effort in a row. The commitment level for the digital badge is far less than a full exam, but I'm surprised that actually the commitment that students are actually able to put into it, it actually takes a lot longer in some ways than I thought. The feedback that we're able to give is much more detailed and I think accurate. And the more I do this, where we're, we, we have some evaluators doing this kind of thing, we catch ourselves or we get to the end of the piece, we're so used to having to make all of the feedback in one listening live that we see in the digital badges. We can go back and listen to the to the piece again because students are submitting recordings. I listen to the piece two or three times at least when I'm giving feedback to make sure I'm not missing anything. In terms of an exam, that's not possible and certainly not possible in a music festival. The style of feedback we can give is more like a festival adjudication. It's much more detailed, but we can go back and verify and we're not distracted by listening to groups of students at once and trying to find first, second, third place. It's only one student on their own terms. They've submitted their ideal performance and we can give a lot more ideal feedback under this controlled environment. Students through the process learn to self-critique and really own their own work. And I'll talk about how that works a little bit in the future here as we go along the presentation today. I think it provides a more realistic step for most students to start with assessments or to fill the gap in between years where, you know, it's just not going to line up this year. We want to put the extra three or four months into putting the whole exam together because we're kind of ready to go on to the next grade, let's say, and they're excited to learn new repertoire. The digital badge can be inserted rather quickly in some cases to fill that gap if they still want that performance goal or they want some kind of credential that says that they pass that level. Um, and it offers a more inclusive, inclusive alternative to exams uh, because we feel that anybody can participate in these regardless of their situation because we can control the environment so well. And I think that's really one of the keys here is to control the environment. Again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box, those of you that are watching live uh, with me on Zoom here today. So how does it all work? Whether it's piano, now voice and guitar, students simply pre-record using video and audio any three pieces of repertoire at any level that they choose to fit into at any time of the year as they get into the process they make successive reattempts as they learn to self critique their work i've had students come in and feel they're ready to do it we record it we listen back to it right away and then you see the wheels turning they're not happy with that performance the nice thing that they learn right away those that have done exams in the past is if you do an exam, you can't control it. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to live with it. Whereas in this case, you know what? I, let's work on a few things together. And I'm going to try this again next week. And they come back next week. And, I, and I've seen students go six weeks in a row on the same piece before they're fully happy. We would have never had that process because we don't get that immediate feedback in the exam necessarily. And once the exam is done, there's no way they're going back to their repertoire. So the video camera, and I learned this through the pandemic when we finally had recordings going around whether it was for the, for the recital we were going to broadcast or whether students wanted to send recordings because the internet connection wasn't so great. This was a really neat process to see that students were rarely actually satisfied with their work and it brought them to a new level of recording. And, I, and even though now we're back to in-person lessons and some students are doing exams again, I pull, I pull the webcam out a lot and record on my computer with a good mic so we can listen back to it often so that they immediately see and get that feedback and they can get into that self-critical mode in a way that's different from the past. The repertoire and level choice is up to the student and the teacher. 
and any repertoire they feel appropriate for their level, and this is up to the student and teacher, is, is, is required. They can do this without approval. So if you a student is working on their own or you're working with them and you say, okay, the student's working at about a grade three level, we can choose music that we feel is a roughly at the grade three level. If there's a grade two piece, that's okay. If there's a grade four or five piece, that's okay. As long as the majority, let's say two out of the three pieces are at the grade three level, it's fine. So it's open-ended. The syllabus lists for our certificate exams are there to use as a guide as well as our publications, but the repertoire can come from anywhere and we're not going to verify for you whether they're right or not. Just use your own judgment. You can use the judgment of another teacher. It's really not so picky about that. You get to choose the level. We're just there to provide the feedback really is, is what we're most interested in so that the student can get some verification that they're on the right track or consider those next steps in order to improve their playing or their level. So students register in their student portal and they upload three sharing links to the three pieces once they're done. Sometimes it only takes a couple of weeks. Some students take a few months to put this together. It doesn't really matter when it comes, but once the three links are uploaded, then an examiner is alerted in our new system and they can go in and listen and evaluate and provide the feedback in a fairly quick manner, in a matter of days usually. Um, along with the feedback, an examiner chooses or awards a gold, silver, or bronze standing to the overall performance of the three pieces. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And then the digital badge is awarded right in the portal so they can download it, they can view it, they can share it on social media or whatever they want to do with it. Some people actually print it off and, and teachers have done some really creative things with them, presenting them on pieces of paper or cardstock at recitals and things like that. If a student wants, if they're not happy with their standing, they can resubmit the three pieces uh, at half the fee to get reappraised in, in, in an effort to raise their standing. So if they got a, a silver, which honestly, there's a lot of silver, a few students are getting gold. We haven't seen any bronze yet, uh, but if a student wanna raise it, they can certainly resubmit and, and raise their standing in that way. Here's what the badges look like when they get issued. You can see I've got a sample here of gold, what the silver, what the bronze looks like. For piano repertoire, we have actually levels one through 10. Voice is also the same one through 10 to match our existing syllabi. And the new guitar badges go from levels one to eight to match the guitar syllabi that we have available. And you can see at the bottom, it says either piano repertoire, voice repertoire, or guitar repertoire. And again, students can share these however they like, use them, display them, that kind of thing. We think they're very attractive looking and something intrinsic, an intrinsic war, a reward that, that students can strive for in their learning. What does gold indicate? Gold indicates at least an 86% in a traditional marking standard. If a student was taking an exam, the average of the three pieces would be at least 86%. And here we have notes and rhythm in place. Articulation is thought out, phrasing and dynamics are observed. May not be perfect, it may not be that 90%, but everything there in the musical elements are observed. A silver is between somewhere between 76% and 85% in a traditional marking standard. They may have some minor rhythmic issues. If a student has serious enough rhythmic issues, it's less than an 80 typically on an exam for that piece of music. Um, and the other musical elements are either vague or missing. And so the more of those musical elements are, are there, the closer we get to 85. But in this middle category, we just simply award silver. And again, it's the detailed feedback that the student and the teacher are gonna get through the written report, which is, like I said, much more lengthy than we can provide on an exam. And that guides the student about what exactly to address next. More often than not, a student has minor rhythmic issues that puts them in the silver category right away, if not bronze, but they're showing some dynamic contrast. Maybe they don't have any inflection and they're playing it with crescendos, diminuendos in the phrases where they haven't thought out their articulation. Those are typical silver performances. And we see a lot of teachers submitting students that are in that kind of category that aren't ready to really listen at the lesson to that level to commit to be able to make those changes. And so we feel that the teachers are looking for that feedback to give back to the students. They see this really is important. When you get it from another angle, it can really be helpful. And so I think a lot of teachers in the past would put students in music festivals and we're seeing numbers at music festivals drop through the floor over the last five, six, seven years. And I think that's a big part of it is students are intimidated to go on stage in that way and get that feedback. The digital badges, I think, are really a great alternative to the music festival because it eliminates the competition that students don't seem to want these days, but they can get even more meaningful feedback because, like I said, we can listen to the recordings multiple times and really make sure we get it right. We're not distracted by other things going on in the moment at a live festival. 
Bronze is less than a 76% of traditional marking standard. We don't see this very often, but basically there are rhythmic difficulties. It certainly is lacking in expression. And I'll talk a little bit about how examiners listen. I've mentioned these kind of things before, but I'll go through our critical listening protocol so we understand that. So how do we know what repertoire or level to choose? This is a common question we get. Um, teachers should assist, I think, by suggesting the best level to the student when they're interested in this. But usually you're already studying within some kind of Canadian conservatory system. So you have a good idea of what level or grade to start at. I always caution you to leave a little bit of room. You know, if you're not sure if it's a level four or a five, it's better to err on the lower side, I think. It, it makes it a little bit easier for students. Um, you can pick that slightly easier piece if you need to. It doesn't matter if one of the pieces are at that level five. We're not so sticky about that repertoire. And I know some of you do reach out once in a while and say, you know, what, what level is this piece at for the digital badge? We started giving out ranges of levels because we don't want you to be boxed into, yeah, you have to use this at level four on a digital badge. We'll say this is anywhere between level three and five. Okay, so there's a little bit of leeway there. We're not so concerned about that for the digital badges. Our concern is getting more students involved in the assessment process and in the learning process. Um, so choose the level that best fits into the majority of the repertoire being considered. The repertoire can be of any mix of style or genre. It doesn't have to be all classical or contemporary. It can all be by the same composer. It really doesn't matter. If a student has written their own music, they can perform all three pieces of their own music. They don't have to submit scores for any of this at all. We're just simply listening to the music and, and giving ideas based on what we hear. I think the best thing though is try to choose music that's relevant to the student's experience and something that they're going to find enjoyable, that they're going to enjoy working on and they're really going to own. You can use the exam syllabus list as a guide, but again, you don't need approval from us to use the pieces on a digital badge. Consider asking another teacher. Um, the pieces again can be a mix of different levels. Just find that best fit line, leaving room for the next level, as I mentioned earlier. In the performances that are recorded, if students want to use backing tracks or other accompaniment, and of course, those of you doing this for voice for sure are likely going to have some kind of backing track or live accompaniment with an accompanist in the background at the piano. Of course, that's expected. On the guitar, same thing. I think it would be nice if you could have a second guitarist in the background or some kind of ensemble or backing track playing. We certainly encourage that. And for the piano students, most of them play solo. But once in a while, we hear something with the backing track. That's nice, too. And it's helpful to keep the students on track and show that they can they can play in time. Now, the syllabus itself is available online. And maybe I'll just deviate for a moment here over to the website so you can see where that is. Here's our website, conservatorycanada.ca. This is the home page. There's two ways to get to the digital badges. You can scroll down and find the digital badge section here, learn more about digital badges, or you can learn the learning tab at the top. Digital badges is the third choice. Either of those links takes you to the same place. And you can see we have new voice and guitar digital badges now available. I'm gonna to link to this webinar here on this page shortly so that people can watch the webinar. And I think this is gonna be the most definitive one we've done so far. And then we have the syllabi downloads where you can view the piano repertoire, voice repertoire, or guitar repertoire digital badges. If I open the guitar repertoire digital badge syllabus, the PDF pops up with all of the particulars there, starting with our mission, the benefits of the digital badge, the requirements at a glance, the guide to choosing repertoire, notes on how to record it and what to use and, and how to go about that so that you're getting a quality recording, how performances are assessed using the gold, silver, bronze standard, and the registration fees. And I'll talk about that a little bit back in my slideshow here. So that's where you get all of that from the website. Here's the fee schedule. It's a lot It's a lot less expensive, I think, and about a third of the price of a, of a regular certificate exam. Levels one to three students can get involved for $49. Levels four to six is $59. Levels seven, eight is $69. And then the higher levels for voice and piano, levels nine and 10 are $89. If students want to resubmit, they can resubmit for roughly half of the fee. And they just simply register for that in their portal and upload the three links again to go through that process. What does the feedback look like? This is something that, you know, a question we've had before. Here's an example from one piece of a piece of feedback that was given quite a while ago. I'll just read this out here for those of you that aren't able to read or see this on the screen. It's a lovely tone and patient, thoughtful opening phrases. You use your arms well to create tone and expressiveness. They were commenting on the technique that the student's using. 
It is interesting to hear the time and space you create within the phrases. There is some suitable dynamic contrast coming across with some inflected crescendo and diminuendo ideas. So we're being really specific. And there's a lot of praise there. We're trying to note what's working, what's currently working for the student. There are a few places where you hesitate and have to replay a chord. This is an accuracy thing that we look for in an assessment. We don't typically write that kind of thing on an exam report. There isn't time for an examiner to do that. But it's something that I think the teachers appreciate when, when the students, oh, okay, yeah, I, you know, something we tell our students continually. But when they see it in written form like that, it can kind of hit them with a little bit more detail and impact. Best to just continue on without retrying or trying to correct things if something doesn't quite work out. We get the feeling of beginning, middle, and end, a nice sense of structure developing. That's sort of a final step, which is nice to see uh, in performance. And so the next steps we try to focus on as well, the next step would be consider refining your phrasing now so that we hear more of a crescendo diminuendo arc under phrases. And then we comment right now, there are more than one accented pulses within the phrases, bringing the listener's ear to the smaller details rather than the larger units. So we're trying to be specific so that teachers can relay the information in a way that makes sense to the student and that gives them something to listen for. Fewer accented pulses, and you can always go back to the recording and refer to this, which is really nice. The students save the recording or they can get it in the student portal, and you can go back and listen to the things that the assessor is hearing. And then also someone's added here, consider calming the body, listen for fewer accents, less movement from the body, as this translates easily to extra sound on the piano something that the, the assessor noticed in the video that the student go back and listen for as they watch. So very explicit feedback. And then we also praise them at the end, very enjoyable to hear this. That's just for one of the piece, you would get a, a similar feedback for three pieces on the digital badge uh, quite quickly. So that's a little idea about what that looks like. I'll talk about the critical listening protocol. This is something that we use with our examiners to focus their listening. And I often say examiners listen in layers. They first want to listen to notes and rhythm, and rhythm really is the most important thing. How steady is this piece? Is the tempo fluctuating? Is the rhythm obvious? Is the student playing with a really strong sense of pulse as if the metronome is ticking kind of thing? And once that's in place, then our ear goes to the articulation. Is the student speaking the notes the way they ought to be? Are they attentive to releases, lifts, staccato? How crisp is the staccato? What's the quality of the overlap in the legato? And if that's thought out and in place, then the, examiner, the examiner's ear goes to phrasing, inflection, and dynamics. Is there variability in the volume, and is it making sense into a coherent musical structure? And then after that, the examiner, if that's in place, is listening for style and performance practice. Does this sound like Baroque music? Are they showing suitable restraint for classical music? Are they showing suitable rubato and phrasing for romantic music with more expression? Those kind of things, if any of those base layers is missing, the examiner's ear stops at that moment and the, and the comments should only reflect that base layer that's missing. If there are rhythmic difficulties, that gets noted on the exam form or in the assessment and the examiner's ear doesn't go beyond that. Even if the student does have dynamic contrasts and yet we're hearing this pulse that's a little bit all over the place, that's where the comments will focus so that we get that base layer in place and we don't get distracted or the student gets distracted by not understanding how that base layer works musically and so that you can build from that. One of the final steps to get a student into the 90s would be structure and depth of communication. And wrapped around all of that is the idea of core sound and tone quality, whether it's the piano, the voice, or the guitar. Let's say in the voice, for example, or, or string players, we listen and assess for tone quality quite consciously right away. On the piano, guitar, not so much but examiners are listening for that. What's the tone quality? How is the student producing tone? That influences everything that we're doing. So again, the examiner's ear progresses to the next level of listening only once the previous layer is heard. And so roughly, if a student wants to get in the 80s, that first rhythm of rhythm first has to be there. If it's not quite there, the student will score less than 80 on the piece. Once the rhythm is there, Good articulation can get you up to about 83 or 84%, but you won't progress past that until we hear phrasing, and phrasing inflection and dynamics. That gets a student into 85, 86 territory, which would be a gold standard on any of the digital badges. And then from there, style and performance practice are in place. That's you know up into the 90% range on an exam and still within gold on an exam standard. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Again, if anyone has any questions, we're coming to the end of the presentation. I wanted to keep this short and succinct today. Again, please share these webinars with others. 
Uh, I think it's really important that they see this. We see a bunch of you, often the same bunch of you, checking out the, the webinars here live with me and probably, I think, viewing them on the YouTube channel. Uh, if anyone's not familiar, maybe what I'll do is I'll just go to the YouTube channel for a moment here from my screen. I do this once in a while so that we can see. One second here, I just got to figure out how to get this off the screen. The usual method's not working. Exit full screen is not working. Here, just give me a second here. There we go. So we're going to YouTube channel. And Conservatory Canada TV is how you find it. And here's one of the home pages here. This looks different all the time. You can go to different playlists and see different playlists here. We have Teaching Beginner Piano, Christopher Norton, video, our, uh, tutorials are all on his own channel, Music Pedagogy Research, anything to do with SuperScore. All of the webinar replays are housed in the webinar replay channel. I'll just come to that quickly here. This was the webinar we did last week with Brock Chart. And you can see on the right-hand side, all the previous webinars in order are all there. Dr. Scott Price, Andrew and I gave you a piano publication update. Chris Norton was here on March 1st. Eleanor Gummer and Cecile de Rosier talking about women composers and so on down the line. That's where you can find the list of all the previous webinars. Right now, it's at least the last two years and then some. So a really great resource. If any of you feel like you're behind or feel like you missed something, that's where you're going to find everything under the webinar replay uh, list. From the home page, it's a little more convoluted. You can go to the live tab and see most of them there. But once in a while, I have to use a different, a different recording. And so they don't appear here. In videos, you'll see most of them in terms of the oldest to the or the latest to the to the oldest. And then toward the bottom, you can also see mock exams and things like that. If you look at the mock exam webinar replays or the mock exam playlist, you'll see four mock exams there that we did two years ago that I think are quite illuminating. Okay, so we have a question here in the chat box. I'm just going to stop sharing here. Okay, so you're considering having one of your students with a disability take the digital badge assessment rather than prepare for a complete exam. Should we advise of the disability and how it affects their work ahead of time? That's a good question. I mean, certainly for an exam, right? We make accommodations all the time for students doing exams. There are a lot of really bright and brilliant young students taking our exams, and sometimes they have an exceptionality. If you let the office know for the exam, we can alert the examiner and make sure that experience is tailor-made to that student a little better. In terms of the digital badge, I think that would be helpful to know um, because it can help frame our comments a little bit differently and we can be a little bit more sensitive to what the student might be going through. So in terms of where to do that, there's two places to do that. Number one, you can just simply email the office and say, for this digital badge for this student, this is the consideration or this is the, the exceptionality that we see or we have, the other place is when the student registers in the special instructions box. For some students, this would work just fine to alert us there when they register, but that information typically shows up in the student portal. So we can be sensitive and we can say, maybe this information goes in an email to the office. So either one of those two channels, I think it is suitable anytime to let us know what an accommodation might be, what the disability might be. And then we can take that into account when we're making our exams with a little bit more, or our, our feedback with a little more tact. Okay, so someone's saying, yeah, what I've said totally reflects your studio experience in terms of lack of interest in exams and distractions today that interfere with student attention for practicing. And you're thanking us for the opportunity to motivate and educate students and teachers. You're welcome, Karen. Thanks so much for that feedback. That's great to hear. Certainly appreciate that kind of feedback. Are there any other questions here? I think for the inter in the interest of time, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off the recording there. And typically what I've started doing last week, I, I started this as a number of you that, that hang on at the end of the webinar. And so what I'll do is I'll stop the YouTube stream now. Any of you that have registered live here, there's a, there's a bunch of you. I'll, I'll allow you to, to come off mute in case you have any questions for me privately that we can do without the replay. Everybody else, thanks for joining me today for this webinar on digital badges. Please share it if you can so that others know the information. And we'll see you next Friday. That's April 19th with Christopher Norton. Hopefully you'll join us then. Thanks.